Christ our Savior. All right. I've got a picture before uh, on the back here, and I would just like to uh, read for you a uh, quote from one Napoleon. Um, hands up if you have never heard of Napoleon. Good. Yeah, that's how to get interaction with the audience, right? All right, good. There's a couple of you. All right, good. Yeah, so you can kind of see he's a general, right? You know, he's a guy. He's, you know, pretty smart, pretty smart, pretty brilliant guy, a military man. But let me just read to you uh, what he said about Christ. From first to last, Jesus is the same, always the same, majestic and simple, infinitely severe and infinitely gentle. Throughout a life passed under the public eye, he never gives occasion to find fault. The prudence of his conduct compels our admiration by its union of force and gentleness. Alike in speech and action, he is enlightened, consistent, and calm. Sublimity is said to be an attribute of divinity. What name, then, shall we give him in whose character were united every element of the sublime, the ultimate. I know men, and I tell you that this Jesus is not a man. Everything in him amazes me. His spirit outreaches mine. His will confounds me. Comparison is impossible between him and any other being in the world. He is truly a being by himself. His ideas, his sentiments, and truth that he announces, his manner of convincing, are all beyond humanity and the natural order of things. His birth, the story of his life, the profoundness of his doctrine, which overturns all difficulties and is their most complete solution, his gospel, the singularity of his mysterious being, his appearance, his empire, his progress through all centuries and kingdoms, all this is to me a prodigy, an unfathomable mystery. I see nothing here of man. Near as I may approach, closely as I may examine, all remains above my comprehension. Great with the greatness that crushes me. It is in vain that I reflect, all remains unaccountable. I defy you to cite another life like that of Christ. And I left my clicker on the chair. Christ our Savior. But if I was to actually push the issue a little bit, as Christians, we're actually, it's, it's not quite enough. It's not quite enough for us to say, Christ our Savior. We just want to change one of these words to really bring it into focus. It's the word our into the word the. We don't actually propose that Christ is our Savior. We propose that Christ is the Savior. And I would like to hear if anyone can just kind of boldly shout out, what's the difference between Christ our Savior and Christ the Savior? Savior of everyone, even those who haven't been accounted Right. Right? Ownership. Oh, say that again. Ownership. Ownership? What do you mean? That he owns us. Ah. Okay, so does he own just his own? No. Right, Christ our Savior. It's not quite enough, is it? It's not quite enough. Christ the Savior. Right, we're kind of catching the difference here. Right, when we say that Christ is our Savior, and someone else says to us, well, he's not mine, I'm glad that works for you, right? Right? If Christ is the Savior, right, what are we saying about all other beliefs at the same time? When we say Christ is the Savior, what are we automatically saying about all other beliefs? Who said it? We're saying they are wrong. Did you know that? Did you know that Christians do not Christians, the Bible, all right, I'll back that off a little bit. The Bible does not make a claim that says Christ is our Savior. You go figure out who yours is. The Bible makes the claim that Christ is the Savior. 
That's the claim. Now, where do you live? Right? Western, contemporary, North America. How does this go? You know, last time you tried this with a friend of yours at the coffee shop. Not very well. <laughs> Not very well, right? What is said of us when we say Christ is the only way? Intolerant. Ignorant. The kind of ignorant, not, not the kind of ignorant, well, maybe the kind of ignorant that means you just don't know enough, right? Obnoxious, good. Intolerant, ignorant, obnoxious. Ooh, ooh. Boy, I hope you're going to preach on all that, Dave. <laughs> I should never have opened this up to the floor. <laughs> right? right? Uh, we haven't even hit the word that I really kind of was thinking was going to come up. Ooh, judgmental, good. Narrow-minded. This is, this is all fantastic. Wow, sorry? Arrogant. There we go. Persecution, what do you mean? Ah, okay. So it seems like, it kind of feels like we're on the receiving end of the persecution. Is that what you mean? Right. Yeah. Why? Well, we're on the receiving end because we're arrogant, intolerant, obnoxious, ignorant, all those things, right? That's, that's what we are because we actually believe that Christ is the Savior. And we actually believe that Christ is the Savior because the Bible has told us that Christ is the Savior. And we actually believe the Bible because of one hour sermon that Dave gave a few months ago that defended the historical reliability of the Bible. Right. So all of which you can find on YouTube if you like our page on Facebook. I saw that on the slide. All right. Good. Isn't it arrogant of you to think that the Christian faith is the only way to God? Where do you get off thinking that you're right and everybody else must be wrong? Look, it doesn't matter which path of the mountain you're on. They all lead up to the top. Right? Right? Is it right? Okay, anyway, right? But boy, it sounds wise, doesn't it? it, it but it's not. I'm going to love having you right there for the rest of this sermon. All right? This is good. It is not, right? <laughs> Some paths have a dead end, an impassable barrier. This is good. Some paths might even be on the wrong mountain, but I'll leave that one alone. All right? All right, I'll leave that one alone. Okay, good. It does sound wise. And why do people say this? Think that Christians are arrogant for believing that Christ is the only way to God? Let's take a little peek and see if we can get behind this and see what is actually behind this a little bit. So, so there are three uh, major assumptions, okay, hidden behind this statement that anyone, especially you Christians, that think you've got the only way to God are arrogant, right? That thrust. There are three major assumptions behind this statement that if they were true, I'm going to show them, if these assumptions were in fact true, I would actually agree with them 100%. If these three assumptions I'm about to show you are true, then the statement that the Christians that believe that Christ is the only way to God would be absolutely correct, and I'd be 100% behind them. So let's take a peek at these three assumptions if I can get this to behave as we seek. Ah, assumption number one. It's hidden right in there, right, that says that, look, if you really think you're the one that owns truth, you know, you're pretty arrogant, right? Assumption number one behind that is this. If all people are equal, then all the ideas that people have are also equal, right? That's an assumption. Since all people are equal, all ideas are equal. Assumption number two. All religions, after all, basically have the same goal. Right? When we kind of look at them all, and you're the one that thinks you've got the right one, what are you doing? They all basically have the same goal. Assumption number three. 
You know, like these teachers and these founders, surely they have taught basically the same things. And when it comes to them talking about themselves, they've said the same things. You know, basically. Right? The person who says, you think you got the truth? You're arrogant. Right? Like, I, I, you, your faith, it's just where you're born, isn't it? It's just the family you happen to be born into. All these religions basically are saying the same things. Do you see what I'm... Are you here? Right? This is what's behind this. When they say that the belief in the Christian faith is arrogant as far as being absolutely exclusive, that is the only correct way, when they're saying that, this is what they're actually... This is, this is what they're biting on, right? In behind. So let me just quickly take a look at these three assumptions. I already saw some head nodding, like, no, 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 as soon as I put them up, which is fantastic, which means it's like self-evident to you, that these three assumptions are bogus, are bogus. But we're going to start with the first one. These three assumptions are bogus. And we're going to start with the first one. All ideas are equal, since all people are equal, right? Idea number one. So let you know this will be quick. We can just think of a couple of scenarios, right? So here I am flying a plane. I'm a pilot. And the co-pilot beside me is also flying a plane. And we're equal, right? I'm equal. I, you, me and you, we're equal. You know, am I equal to you? Yeah, you're equal to me. Okay, good. So we've established that these two human beings are equal. I have decided that landing this plane, I've got this really cool idea that landing this plane requires a certain vector and a certain velocity and a certain speed for that plane to land. The issue is, is that my equal counterpart beside me, this pilot over here, he thinks that it can be done at double the speed. That's his idea. Right? He thinks we can come in twice as fast and still land this plane. All ideas are equal, aren't they? No. <laughs> That's absurd. Right? That's absurd. We're, but we're both equal. Yes, we are both equal. And we both generated the idea. All ideas are equal because we're right. We're, no. Okay, so now I'm going to cross a bridge. Maybe that Winnipeg Bridge over, what is that river? Red? Thank you. Whoa. <laughs> I'm still learning this place, right? I'm going to cross that bridge, right? And the guy who built that bridge, you know, his ideas around the physics and the forces and the stresses and the materials that can actually hold and suspend that bridge up are um, a, a different, and he's an engineer. They're different than mine. I'm not an engineer. So, you know what? Uh, how about I build that bridge as a non-engineer on my ideas? And... Um, why don't, you, why, don't you, why don't you just kind of take a drive across my bridge? Right? Not without a life jacket, Not without a life jacket right? Right? You know, who's going to drive across my bridge, right? But I'm equal to the engineer. Yes, you are. And my ideas are that this is right. No. So it's absolutely bogus that the equality of people does not mean the equality of ideas. It's wrong. Ideas are hierarchical. They are to be weighed. Some are better, some are worse, right? They go this way. People go that way. Ideas go this way, right? That's the thing with ideas. The second little logical one here, I'm just going to put it out there. What logical test this actually failed is called the law of the excluded middle, all right? Big fancy thing, but it basically goes like this. If two things share one thing in common, they must share everything in common. Hmm? It's a, that's, it's a fallacy. It's a logical fallacy, right? Since elephants have ears and Dave has ears, therefore Dave is an elephant, right? That's the logical fallacy that this first assumption is just, it, right? Since all people are equal, one thing in common, therefore everything about them is equal, right? Right? No. Right? That's the law of excluded middle violated. Okay, number two. Oh, no. No, there we go. All religions have the same goal. I got to go, like, I can't give you the survey of religions, okay? But I'm just going to give you a couple of real quick ones right off the bat here. All right, we're going to start with uh, Hinduism. We'll go that way. Hinduism, the goal of Hinduism. All right, the goal of Hinduism. Who knows it? Nobody? Good. The goal of Hinduism is to, <laughs> is to take yourself right? Your Atman, yourself, 
and to become unified with the Brahman, right? The absolute, impersonal universe, right? That's the goal, to take yourself and to become the universe, right? That's the goal, all right? So this is the goal. All religions basically have the same goal, right? Okay, that's the Hinduism goal in a nutshell, nice and short. Okay, now we're going to go to Buddhism, right? Buddhism, spin-off of Hinduism. It must be, you know, basically the same goal, and I'm just working away at a little clip here in the back of my uh, shirt, so thank you. Buddhism's goal. Buddhism's goal, so Hinduism says the self needs to become one with the universe. Well, the Buddhist is saying, well, you know, the goal, the goal of this religion is to actually stop and cease all suffering. These don't, already don't sound the same. I hope you're recognizing that, right? One is self to become one with the universe, and the other is we need to get rid of all suffering. Already not the same, right? Already, like, not the same goal at all, and it gets even more fun than this. The self needs to become one with the universe. That's the Hindu side. We're going on the Buddhist side, right? That we need to eliminate all suffering. And what are the things that suffer? Who suffers? People suffer, right? Selfs suffer. Track with me. The Hindu needs to take the self and become one with the universe. That's his goal. The Buddhist is saying we need to eliminate all suffering. And since selfs suffering, since selfs suffer, that's who suffers, actually what we need to eliminate is the selves. Woo! Woo! Right? We need to eliminate the selves. Now, I'm not talking genocide. Okay? They're, <laughs> they're not going around killing. That's not what I'm talking about. Right? But this consciousness of yourself needs to be one with the universe. That's the Hindu side. The Buddhist is saying, nah, your mistake is that you think you exist at all. That's what you've got to get rid of. That's why you're suffering. Right? Told, like, this isn't... All religions teach the, have the same goal, right? Self with universe or annihilation of self. Sounds about the same, doesn't it? Right? No. Good. Good. Islam. Goal of Islam. The very word Islam is its goal. Submission. Obedience. Right? That's its goal. Complete obedience. Obey Allah. That's his goal. Judaism. Keep the laws, await the Messiah. There it is. That's the goal. Right? Is anybody comfortable with saying, well, all religions believe basically the same thing? Right? Like we're 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 not even we're not even on the same platform. How how does each faith deal with guilt and forgiveness? You know, how do we deal with what's wrong with us? Right? It's the human race. What's wrong with us? Okay, well. We'll go back to Hinduism. We'll go back to Buddhism. What's wrong with us? Well, what's wrong with us? Well, they're going to fight about that, whether it's the self or not the self. But basically, the one thing they, they share, they have a word they share, okay, and it's called karma. You've heard this before. They share the word karma. And the basic idea is this, that the good deeds on this side of the teeter-totter and the bad deeds are on that side of the teeter-totter, and we all know teeter-totters do this, right? Okay. And if your bad deeds uh, outweigh your good deeds, okay, 10, 5, right, you are now transferring, you know, your, your time through this life has created a negative 5 karma. You see what just happened? 10 bad against 5 good, you're at minus 5. You owe the universe 5 good. All right? But don't worry you'll get another crack at it. Okay? So this five good, you die, and then you reincarnate, and guess what you get to pick up with? You get to start with the minus five. Right? There you go. We're, we're getting it, right? Okay? And so now, now you're starting at minus five, and you've got work to do, right? You've got work to do. Right? But here's the funny part. Even... Even part of the way you're going to pay for this minus five is how you come back. You might come back, you might have left your, your first life as a prince, and you're going to come back as a peasant. 
And that's actually a gift from the universe. Okay? The universe has done you good by bringing you back as a peasant because it's going to help you pay back your minus five. Right? That's, that's going to help you there. Part of it. So now you're sitting here going, well, this is interesting. So the life I'm in right now is completely because of the life that happened to me before. And I can really only progress forward if I uh, clean up my act and fix things according to my scriptures. Can't get into that, okay? So basically, for everything that I've done wrong and everything I do wrong and everything I feel, how do I actually get released from or forgiven from that? And the answer is, is you don't. The word forgiveness doesn't really play in the karmic world, in the East. There isn't any forgiveness. There's nothing to be saved from. It's simply a debt that has to be paid. That's all. Don't get forgiven. You pay. Right? That's the Eastern logic. There's no, no get out of jail free card. You pay. Okay? Islam, you're going to do your good deeds. You're going to do them. But even your good deeds are still bad deeds. And so you kind of hope that your good deeds are mostly good. And when you face Allah, you better hope he's in a merciful mood because you don't really know. Okay? So it's not about forgiveness either. It's not about forgiveness either. All right? Founders of the faith, do they teach essentially the same thing? Okay, well, Hinduism, you can't even nail down a founder. Okay? It's, there isn't really one. But maybe the most famous one you can pick out is Krishna. Right? You might be able to do that in the teachings of Krishna. You might find his name. And Krishna might have been the ninth incarnation of the god of Vishnu, but he might not have been. He doesn't even know himself if he was. But everybody around him thought he was, so that was good enough for him. Okay? Right? Like, I don't know. I don't know if I am a, a reincarnate. Do you guys all think I am? Yes, I do. Well, then I guess I am. Right? That's what was surrounding Krishna. Buddhism? What does this founder teach? He teaches, again, that your problem with all of your suffering is because you have a self. And your self wants things. It wants things. So if you can just get rid of the wants, all your desires, that's one of the steps to getting rid of yourself. And they give you a formula. Follow this set of rules, follow that set of rules, fourfold truths, followed by eight paths, and you'll get there. And once you've finally gotten there, Yourself will cease to exist. Hmm. Nirvana. Okay. Islam, what does he say? Well, here's a line. Say, I do not say to you, I possess the treasuries of God. Okay. I do not say that I possess the treasuries of God. I know not the unseen. And I say not to you that I am an angel. I'm none of those things. I don't know the treasures of God. I'm not an angel. I don't know the unseen. I only follow what is revealed to me. Does that sound anything like Christ? Right? Nothing. Nothing like Christ. Okay. Changing gears. So, what do you think of the three assumptions? Are the three assumptions true? Yeah. Right? And so the premise that this thing was built on is it's broken. It's broken. In fact, if you really think about it, there is only one person on the landscape of absolute truths that is making the claims of forgiveness and salvation. There's only one that even makes the claim. No one else even does. And is it actually arrogant to believe or to, to accept the only one that's actually offering it? Nobody else is even offering it. Like it's, it's not even there. All right. Let's just kind of grab this if I can. This is supposed to be humorous, so laugh and just, when I give it to you, not, yeah. All right, so, so do me the favor and laugh, even if you don't find it humorous. But I'm going to share with you the creed, right? It's a poem, right? But it's, a creed, it's shaped in the form of, of a creed, which if you've been to any sort of a more traditional liturgical church, you've said creeds before. Okay, so it's, it's shaped that way. It's going to be a creed. And we're going to call this the, the skeptic's creed. Right? The people that charge us. 
with isn't believing in Christianity as the absolute and the only way to God. Arrogant. I'm going to read for you the creed that they live by. All right? It's supposed to be funny. Here it goes. It's not on there. I'm just reading it. There. Stare at the black. Atman. Brahman. Stare at the black. Go ahead. All right? Anyway. Little inside joke. We believe in Marx, Freud, and Darwin. We believe that everything is okay as long as you don't hurt anyone to the best of your definition of hurt and to the best of your definition of knowledge. We believe in sex before, during, and even after marriage. We believe in the therapy of sin. We believe that adultery is fun. We believe that sodomy is okay. And we believe that taboos are taboo. We believe that everything's getting better despite the evidence. To the contrary, the evidence must be investigated and you can prove anything with evidence. We believe that there's something in horoscopes, UFOs, bent spoons, Jesus was a good man just like Buddha, Muhammad, and ourselves. He was a good moral teacher, although we think that his good morals were basically bad. We believe that all religions are basically the same. We believe that after death comes the nothing, because when you ask the dead what happens, they say nothing. If death is not the end, and if the dead have lived, then it's compulsory heaven for all except for Hitler, Stalin, and Genghis Khan. <laughs> we believe in Masters and Johnson. We believe what is selected is average, what's average is normal, what's normal is good. We believe in total disarmament. We believe there's direct links between warfare and bloodshed. Americans should beat their guns into tractors, and the Russians would be sure to follow. We believe that man is essentially good. It's only his behavior that seems to let him down. This is the fault of society. Society is the fault of conditions, and conditions are the fault of society. We believe that each man must find the truth that is right for him. All right? The skeptic's creed. Good. I think you get it. You got it. All right. All right. All right. That's enough time, Dave, talking about what all the other religions believe. Can we spend some time talking about Christ the Savior? All right, are you, are you ready for me to make the shift over into the Jesus part? Okay, good. Little pause. Um, I wanted to uh, just quickly express some thanks to our uh, senior pastor as he has uh, taken over the uh, preaching team, the, the uh, leading team, and you guys know that I'm trying to hone some public speaking skills in regards to, you know, this. Uh, and so he took the challenge, and I've been getting some specific coaching and some specific feedback uh, as we go, and so thank you, Joel, and uh, thank you to you, everyone here as we kind of, you know, so he gave me like a list this long of things to improve, and I have uh, put in... Um, a couple, not because I think he's wrong, but because I believe in incremental change, right? So, you know, just <laughs> little bits as we go here. And, uh, and I think he's absolutely right. Whew, where's Alpha Doric on this one, eh? How about that? Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. On YouTube. All right, turn with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 1. I am uh, using uh, the New Living Translation, not because it's my preferred translation, but simply because that's the Bible that we have right there, available at the church for everybody to use. So if you haven't brought a Bible, uh, we've got a few to hand out, and we would love to hand it out. Otherwise, your, I think, smartphone can keep it, uh, whatever it is you'd like to do. But Romans chapter 1, I will also put it on the screen, but I really do like it when you read your own. Okay? Romans chapter 1. We are going to start with the very stark reality, a very stark truth about the Bible's diagnosis of humankind. That's where we're going to start. We talk about Christ the Savior. We must ask the question, being saved from what? Right? We have to. And that's where we're going to start. This opening passage is going to describe for us the nature of humankind. You're not going to like this one. Okay? Romans chapter 1, starting at verse 18. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God 
because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities. His eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think of foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning. They disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die. Yet, they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. Heavy hitter. This is the famed wrath of God passage in the New Testament by the Apostle Paul. Have you ever asked yourself if you were stranded on an island? Right? You know this game? Stranded on an island with nothing but you and some native tribal people. And you get to keep three books of the Bible. Which three are they? Right? You get to pick three books of the Bible. Ever played that game? I won't share you all three of mine because I encourage you to do yours, but I'll tell you right now the book of Romans for this passage and a few others is one of my three. One of my three. If you could only have three, right? And you had to deal with a, an unreached people group. All right, this is it. Romans chapter one. So what? What are we saved from? Okay. I've used the inspiration of our own uh, Alliance founder, A.B. Simpson, for this. Okay, so uh, if you have a copy of the Fourfold Gospel sitting on your shelf, this will be familiar to you. All right? If you don't and you just know your Bible really well, this will be familiar to you. Okay? Because it's all from the Bible. All right. The Bible teaches that we are, each one of us, me and you and everyone, uh, desperately wicked in our heart. That's our starting point. Fallen, broken, and wicked. You just heard the passage. Okay? So, let's do it. Number one, Christ the Savior saves us from the guilt of sin. The guilt of sin. Sin itself requires punishment. All right? We are guilty of it, and we require punishment. Christ our Savior can save us from the punishment, right? The guilt. Two, wrath of God. This might sound the same. It's not the same, okay? Sin requires punishment, just like my kid staying up late requires a consequence, right? But my child is not going to experience my wrath because he stayed up late, okay? Like, there's a difference. There's a difference between a consequence for an action, sin, guilty, punishment, da-da, 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 right? There's a difference between that and a God who is angry. Angry. And I'll tell you, the Romans 1 passage supports that he is angry. His wrath is coming on mankind. Already has and it really will. 
we are saved from the wrath of God. We are saved also from the curse of the law. The curse of the law. The law came on Mount Sinai. This is an Old Testament thing. This is Moses and over two million people cuddled around a mountain. And what's happening on the top of the mountain? Lightning. Clouds. Thunder. Terrifying. The receiving of the law caused terror among the people to the point that they backed away from the base of the mountain and they said, we can't talk to him. Moses, you do it. And they shoved Moses up and up he went. Now if the receiving of the law causes terror, reflect for a minute what the breaking of the law does. Okay? The curse of the law haunts you. It haunts you. It's justice, right? You break it, you know you've broken it, and it's hunting you. You know it, right? It's after you. The curse of the law. Our evil conscience. I actually, we owe a little thought here to Kelly. There were a few times we heard Kelly, our, our previous pastor, uh, talk about uh, Satan the accuser, right? Satan the accuser. And so we've, we've received our salvation, but, but occasionally we still get this voice accusing us of our, of our dirtiness and our darkness and our awfulness and our left ear, right? And it just tries to drag us right back down again, our conscience, right? He's just drilling away on us. And Kelly pinned that one on Satan, and he's quite correct. But I want to go one further. Your own heart can do that. You don't need Satan to be accusing you and haunting you of your dirtiness, all right? Your own heart can, and you can be saved from that. You can be saved from that. Our evil heart. Our evil heart. You know what's interesting? Is that we hate sin. We hate doing it. But we still do it. A lot. That's a heart problem. That's a heart problem. Fear of death. Fear of death. I have a grandmother who can tell me about every famous person, how they died. She could tell me how they died. Well, this is how that happened. No, 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 you know how he died. No, 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 no. She has a book. Famous deaths. My mom's laughing. It's her mom. <laughs> We're kids. We're climbing the maple tree. She comes running out. Don't climb that maple tree. You might fall. Oh, sorry. Um, in Ontario, there are trees called maples. <laughs> Not Manitoba maples. But anyways, we climb these maples. She come running out. Get out of that tree. What are you going to do? Fall and break your neck and die? It all, like we're six. And it's about, right? It's straight to dying, right? As we're going down the steps, put your hand on that railing. You don't want to fall and die, okay? Now, we're enjoying Grandma, right? But those of us that have been around Grandma know why she is, the birds are circling around this one, okay? She's terrified. She's terrified. I'm not saying everybody that obsesses about death is terrified of death, but I'm telling you my grandmother is. She's terrified as these final years are coming on. She's just, that's why she's talking about it, reading about it, talking about it. It's, it doesn't leave her mind. The fear of death. Satan's power and kingdom. Look at this. I'm going to have to bring this to a close really quickly. Yeah. Satan's power and kingdom. You've heard Bible verses that imply that Satan is the prince of the world, that this is really his dominion, and in fact the air we breathe is actually his poison, right? And it kind of like reprograms us, right? That, the Bible does support this, that this dominion of planet Earth is his. But the Bible also supports the kingdom of Satan, that's one side, has been completely conquered by the kingdom of God. And that when we receive salvation, 
we leave the kingdom of Satan, spiritual realm, if you will. We enter the reign of God in, you know, the Satan poisonous world, in the here and the now. So we can actually get out of the bondage and the trap and the poisonous fumes that Satan offers as he pollutes us and deludes us and completely leads us to the abyss. We can leave it, not just when we die, right now. Right? Right now. And then finally, eternal death. Eternal death. We are saved from eternal death. Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, Away with you, you cursed ones. Into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. Then the Lord will reply. Then they will reply, sorry, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? When did we do that? He will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment. So the words of Jesus, not any other Bible writer, they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. That's the final thing that we are saved from. I'm going to have to move through and take me us right past here. So sorry, everyone, but I've run out of time. Those are the eight things that salvation brings, but you probably were implying it through what we are being saved from. Justification, that is when we stand before God, we stand clean and right, not because we are clean and right, but because Christ was clean and right, and when he looks at us, he's choosing to see Christ. Right? That's what, we, what it brings. God's love and favor. We actually start to enjoy his love and his favor here and now. A new heart. Remember that wicked thing I told you about? Get a new one. Right? Grace to live day by day. So you could get pardoned from prison for committing a crime. And they let you out. Right? But you got no money. You got no nothing. You got nothing to sustain you. That's not how it works with God. He lets you out of prison, and then he gives you clothes, money, and sustenance. Totally different. Right? We get the grace to live day by day, immediately, once we're let out of prison. We get the Holy Spirit. We get God's providence. Remember the famous verse? All things work together for good for those who love him. Right? We get that. We start to get that. Right? We start to get that all things work to good thing. Right? That's what salvation brings. The gateway. After you have salvation, you get all the rest of the blessings now. Sanctification, healing, justification. Right? A whole bunch of other big words. There's four, four more sermons coming. And most excitedly, we get eternal life. There it is. Okay. Can you all write down as a take-home verse... I can't take the time on it. First Peter. Chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Okay. I'll bring it to a close. If you're here today, and um, you already know this. You already know, you have received the salvation. You have received Christ not only as our Savior, but as the Savior. And you have accepted him into your heart. Hopefully, as we surveyed a little bit about the other faiths, as we surveyed a bit about what's actually at stake here, something inside you is burning very, very strongly. Very strongly. That we, we need, we need to reach the lost with this. Look at how serious it is. But if you've come this morning and you are not already an acceptor of this salvation, but you want to, 
You're ready. You want to. You want to become right with God right now. We have a verse at the end of this that just quickly describes how easy this is. The reward for trusting in him will be the salvation of your soul. If you want that today and you're ready, then after our service this morning, you need to come here, just to the front, and just sit here. And our pastor and our elders will meet with you, and we will take you through a quick process. It's quick, but it has eternal ramifications. Christ is not just our Savior. He is the Savior. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for what you've created. I thank you that we are made in your image. I thank you that you gave us your truth and your word to in fact describe our condition crystal clear. And if we are honest, we cannot deny it. I thank you, Father, that you didn't leave us there in our guilt, but that you gave us a way. You first gave us the law to accuse us of our sins, and then you gave us your Son to bear them. Father, it is the most wonderful story. It is the most wonderful offer. And there is nothing more important to us as humans than the fact that we need to be rescued. You have rescued us. And we now need to accept it. Thank you, Jesus. We pray these things in your name. Amen.